Thomas Alva Edison. He was a maverick, the scrawny boy with the round face, big blue eyes and broad brow. Mischievous and inquisitive, six-year-old Tom Edison set the family barn on fire just to see what it would do, and tried to make a friend fly by feeding him a gas-producing laxative. After the Edison family moved from Ohio, from Ohio to Port Huron, Michigan in 1854, seven-year-old Tom was sent to school, but couldn't conform to the routine. The dreamy and unruly boy may have been dyslexic. His teacher called him addled. His mother, a former teacher, began tutoring her youngest son at home and soon had him reading Shakespeare, Dickens, and Gibbon. At age 12, Thomas Alva Edison launched his business career, hawking newspapers and sundries on sundries on the train that ran between his hometown and Detroit. He experimented with chemicals in the baggage car until his makeshift lab caught fire. Between each daily run he read in a Detroit library. I started with the first book on the bottom shelf and went through the lot one by one, he boasted later. In the 1860s, Edison roamed the country as a telegraph operator. He often neglected his duties to use the lines for experiments, and once blew up a telegraph station while tinkering with a battery. Hot-headed and stubborn, he never kept a job for long. But he kept on reading. Michael Faraday's experimental researches in electricity, which he read in one day, inspired him to become an, invent an inventor. His explanations were simple, Edison said later of the self-taught British scientist. He used no mathematics. He was the master experimenter. With his discovery of Faraday, Edison quit Western Union and devoted all his time to experiments. In 1869, he patented his first invention, an electric vote counter. When he couldn't find a buyer, he formulated a policy he followed the rest of his life. Anything that won't sell, I don't want to invent. No scholar, no thinker about nature's deepest secrets, Edison cared little about advancing scientific knowledge. Instead, he became absorbed in making marketable products and making them quickly. On Christmas Day in 1871, Edison took time out to marry 16-year-old Mary Stilwell, but not much time. An hour after the service, he was back in the lab solving a production problem. By the mid-1870s, the young Midwesterner was well on his way to his reputation as the Wizard of Menlo Park. To this rural New Jersey town, Far from the distractions of city life, he recruited scientists, technicians, and machinists to make inventions to order. From his invention factory came hundreds of products of collective invention shaped by Edison's vision. He left the technical details to his staff. Unlike most of his fellow inventors who worked alone, Edison realized the advantages of many hands and minds. With characteristic bravado, he promised a minor invention every ten days, and a big thing every six months or so. Edison ran the Menlo Park lab, firmly as a medieval abbot ruled a monastery. He drove his devoted insomnia squads day and night. In the wee hours, he revised weary souls with food and drink, with small talk and music from a large pipe organ in the lab. At midnight, organ music boomed from the white clapboard building on the hilltop. Flashes of light radiating from the windows illuminated the supernatural aura of the lab and its wizard. Edison was testing ways to record telegraph messages when he stumbled onto the principles of his most novel invention, the phonograph. Before a few co-workers in November 1877, he shouted, Mary had a little lamb into this new wonder. The witnesses listened, dumbfounded, 
as the phonograph needle ran over indented tinfoil wrapped around a metal cylinder, and the speaker twanged Edison's high-pitched The speaker twanged Edison's high-pitched voice back at them. Poor hearing helped Edison concentrate on his work, but hindered enjoyment of the phonograph, his favorite invention. Deafened by scarlet fever as a child, he hadn't heard a bird sing since he was twelve. To listen to the phonograph, he sometimes had to bite into the speaker horn so the sound would vibrate the bones in his head. Edison came upon many of his inventions while looking for something else. His ability to transform one invention into another invention by mutation rather than flashes of inspiration produced the phonograph as well as the incandescent light, motion picture projector, and a microphone-like carbon transmitter that improved the telephone's audibility. In 1878, Edison turned his attention to perfecting a safe and inexpensive electric light to replace oil lamps and gas lamps, gas lights. <coughs> he was only 31. Europeans had developed the arc light, but its large glaring lamps would not do. Electric current leaping between carbon rods emitted noxious fumes from the golden globes from the open globes. Excuse me. If one lamp blew, the rest of the series went out. One switch controlled the entire circuit. To bring electricity into the home of every man, Edison envisioned a flameless glowing filament inside a small enclosed globe. He would wire his incandescent lamp so each could be turned on and off separately. With only the vaguest notion of how this could be done, Edison announced with supreme confidence that he'd have the answer in just six weeks. The news created a sensation. Stocks of gaslight companies flickered in gloom. Even though Edison worked himself and his men up to 20 hours a day, the solution wasn't to come up for more than a year. They tried dozens of different materials as filaments, including gold, nickel, a fish line, and coconut hair. In the autumn of 1879, Edison discovered that a charred cotton thread would glow for 13 and a half hours. A reporter rhapsodied about the wondrous bulb that lit, lit without a match, glowed without a flame, its bright, beautiful light, like the mellow sunset of an Italian autumn. On New York's eve, a crowd gathered at Le Menlo Park to see strings of the magical new lights burning brightly in and around Edison's lab. No system existed to make and distribute electricity to the consumer. So, amid wild public excitement, Edison designed lamps, screw-in sockets, light switches, insulated wire, meters, fuses, even the central power station. When the pioneering Pearl Street station in Lower Manhattan came into service in 1882, the world moved from the steam age into the electrical age. The year 1900 saw 24 million bulbs carrying out Edison's promise of electric light so cheap that only the rich will be able to burn candles. In 1887, Edison set up a larger invention factory in nearby West Orange stocked with ever, everything from an elephant's hide to the eyeballs of a United States Senator, the lab grew into a com complex with 3,600 workers. Over the next four decades, he and his assistants tested devices that brought 520 patents, including a motion picture camera and projector, an improved phonograph and long playing records, and a business dictating machine. Not all Edison's patents were commercial successes. 50,000 experiments resulted in an alkaline storage battery to power an electric car, but Henry Ford's gas buggies swept the market. Edison's inexpensive prefabricated concrete houses equipped with concrete furniture, ice boxes, and pianos never caught on. <coughs> Edison could be foolhardy with money. The qualities le that led to the light bulb, determination and absolute belief in himself led also to his, to his loss of General Electric 
and a $4 million failure to extract iron from low-grade ore with magnets. He ignored household bills. After his first wife died of a brain tumor, he never paid the doctor. Henry Ford called Edison the world's greatest inventor and worst businessman. Edison's business deals ran from crafty to crooked. He pirated other inventors' ideas and ordered his private eye, Joe Gamshu McCoy, to fix prices and bribe public officials. As Edison grew older, he grew more bullheaded and coarse. When his second wife reproached him for spitting on the floor, he pointed out that the floor itself was the surest spittoon because you never missed it. He bathed as little as possible and often slept in his clothes because he believed changing them caused insomnia. He napped anywhere at any time on anything, atop his desk or curled up like a dog on a stack of old papers under the stairs. Working at night and sleeping by day, Edison hardly saw his family. His wives occupied themselves with parties and pastries, while his six children withdrew into themselves or ran wild. Edison's scorn for mathematics and bulged-headed theorists he defined as scientist, a scientist as a man who would boil his watch while holding onto an egg became a passion. Awkward sentence to read. He turned his back on progress. He wanted no part of electronics, though his accidental discovery of the principles of the vacuum tube laid the foundation of this new industry. He distrusted alternating current, which Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse proved could be sent farther and cheaper than his direct current could. When New York decided to electrocute criminals, Edison's forces urged officials to use Westinghouse current because it was lethal and suggested calling this new method of execution Westinghouse. Edison continued to work into his 80s. It took diabetes, kidney disease, and an ulcer to bring him down on October 18, 1931, exactly 52 years after the birth of his incandescent bulb. He left behind three and a half million pages of letters and lab notes documenting 1,093 patents, the most ever granted to any individual. Part Bunyan and part Barnum, America's most useful citizen had conceived the electric typewriter, electric locomotive, guided torpedo, flor fluoroscope, mimeograph, synthetic rubber, and waxed paper. At dusk, on October 21st, Edison was buried on a hillside overlooking his West Orange lab. As the mourners, most, mostly survivors of the age of steam and gaslight, drifted away, the cool glitter of the electric age spread over the valley below. Gone was the wizard who had brought magic to their lives, the magic of recording a human voice, capturing motion on film, and dispelling darkness at a finger's touch.